It is absolutely my honor and pleasure to be able to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Maria Campbell. Now I have to tell you, I'm only slightly terrified to make this introduction because Maria is such a legend. Um, her work and her legacy as a, a Métis author and artist have, has influenced and encouraged countless Métis people in their own pursuit of literature and arts over the last more than 40 years. She's inspired us to find our voices and for that I'm truly grateful. Writer, filmmaker, and playwright Maria Campbell has published seven books, including Half Breed, which was first published in 1973. Half Breed was recently republished to include pages that were pulled by the publisher from the 73 edition. Yes. Currently, she's working on a new play with Yvette Nolan, Marilyn Patra, and Cheryl Troop. This play just performed a public reading in Toronto to a sold out audience, and it will open in Saskatoon in 2020. Maria is the cultural advisor at the College of Law, University of Saskatchewan, where she also teaches a class on Indigenous legal traditions. She has received numerous honours and awards, among them the Gabriel Dumont Order of Merit, a three-year Trudeau Fellowship at the University of Ottawa, and six honorary doctorates. She is an officer of the Order of Canada. Welcome, Maria Campbell. Thank you. I'm always so nervous when I come here. Where is Rose Richardson? Okay. Now I think I'll get it together. <laughs> Rose and I have been friends since we were really young. And um, she's kind of special in my life. As is GDI. And uh, I want to say good morning, first of all, to all of you, our Mitchiff family, It's a beautiful, beautiful day. A beautiful day in more ways than one. It's our 40th birthday. And happy birthday, everybody. Come on, happy birthday. <laughs> la, 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 la. Come on. <laughs> when I was a little girl, many of us couldn't even go to school. And I'm sure that many of you remember that. We, uh, many of us lived on road allowances or on crown lands. We were known as squatters and road allowance people. And uh, there was nobody that was responsible for those particular people. We didn't have parishes that protected us or, or even uh, anything outside of community leadership. I'm really nervous, and I can't see very good here either. So. And I wrote everything down so I wouldn't miss a word. So many of those people lived on crown lands, on highways that uh, hadn't been built yet. And many of our communities, whole communities, were burned down throughout our history and our people dispossessed. 
And I just want to say, never ever forget that. You know, other people can talk about the kinds of struggles they came through. But in our country, and especially in the Perry provinces, that was not an unknown story to chase the people off their land, whole communities of people, and, and to burn their communities down. The most recent of those, of course, was Le Bret and Crescent Lake, which happened only in the mid-1960s. So all of that kind of history, along with 1885 and, and the struggle for our organization to try and, and rebuild itself and rebuild us, left us feeling really vulnerable. We were made to be ashamed, to feel ashamed of us, ourselves. We had to hide our language. I remember the first day of school in, in our community, and there were three families of us being registered. And that was quite a while ago. But we were so proud to go, and, and our, our, our community was was proud that we were going because un, you know, uh, untrue, a lot of people think that outside people thought that education wasn't important in our communities. It was one of the most important things and I remember my family and the families in the community talking about a time when, when we'd, we'd have an education for our kids. And Riel was a, a role model for that. He was educated. He went to university, granted he didn't finish, but he went. And many other of our people in the 1800s had a good education. And in fact, one of the first people in Canada to graduate from university was a Métis man. But that first day of school were all of these non-Indigenous students, and it was only a one-room school. I remember sitting there, and we used to have to fill forms out that said, what was your racial origin? And um, so my mother put Métis down. My mother was the only person who could uh, read and write in that group of families that were there. And the teacher looked at it, and she said, what's that? And I know, I, I've never forgotten that. All of us kids that were starting school were sitting there really breathless because this was such an exciting day. And she said, what is that? And my mother tried to explain. And, uh, and she said, well, there's no such thing. And so my mom said, well, I guess we're Indians. And uh, she said, then you shouldn't be here. You should, you should be off in residential schools. To make a long story short, she told us, your name is Campbell, so you must be Scottish. And I always remember my little Kokum sitting there. She was just a little tiny thing with her little skinny braids and, and her cane. And she couldn't speak English. And they marked us down as Scott, Scottish people. And our cousins, Vandals, were marked down as French because they said their name was French. And you know, for years after, and, and I've heard many of our families say that this happened to many, many of us, and then we'd be laughed at for trying to pass when it really had nothing to do with trying to pass. It was what was determined for us. But that first day of school really stamped in our heads that Whatever it was that we were was not a very good thing. And, and so I thank GDI for that and for all of us in this room for making the kinds of changes that we've made. So GDI's 40th birthday is a big deal. So I want you to say once more in a loud voice, happy birthday. Happy birthday. That's great. GDI built us a place, gave us a home, 
and what a home we've got. We've come such a long way and we owe such a debt of gratitude to so many people. There's, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to name everybody, but you all know who they are and my old lady brain doesn't always work really good. There's Knapp and there's Cliff and Bob and Rod, Sinclair, my brother Armin, Rose Boyer, Rose Fleury, Frank Tompkins, Jeffrey Morin, Billy and Pauline Welsh, old uncle Medrick McDougall. The list is so long, and I've even almost forgot our Harry. Those are the people who've, who've left us, who were a part of this. And then all of you who are still here, Nora Cummings, Alan, Alan Morin, Jimmy D, Wayne McKenzie, Max Morin, Jim and Marie Favel, TJ Roy, Max Morin, Jean Pelcher, Rose Richardson, Calvin and Cherry Reseth. There's so many more, but I can't remember all their names, but you, but you know who they are. And then there's all of the people, all of those people who put the call out at that 1976 cultural conference that we want an institute to educate, train, and make our people employable. Can you imagine who else would say make our people employable? That tells you how much we wanted to work and how much we loved work. But there wasn't any more rocks and stones and roots to pick in, in Saskatchewan. And so our people said to make us more employable. An institute that will preserve our culture, our heritage, and our language. And all those people who stood up and stomped their feet and cheered, yes, yes, we want an institute. Now I've got to go to some other pages. I'm trying to be really organized. So all of you back then, and all of us today, we can take responsibility for starting the Gabriel Dumas Institute. Take, responsi take responsibility for its incredible success, for that beautiful new building and space. Do you know that when I walked in there, I, I came for a meeting with women of the Métis Nation. Walked in and it was the first time I'd seen it because I was out of town when when they had the grand opening, and I couldn't stop crying, and I'm still choked up over it. I don't know how many of you have been in there, but it's the most beautiful place in the world. I think when I walk in there about all of the clothing that my, my grannies, my aunties, and all of the old people in our communities sat and sewed and created so that we would have food on our table, and they had to sell it, and now it's back in there and it's ours again. So we have that beautiful space for our museum and our archives. That would have made Jim Brady and Malcolm Norris really happy because they always pounded in the heads of all of us who were their students told us, make sure you save every scrap of paper so people will know what we've been doing. And it's all in there. For the recordings and the publishings of our stories and songs, for that amazing art gallery, for all of the videos. And those students, all the students who have graduated and gone on to teaching or to work at trades or just make it big time in the world. We have so many success stories. I want to share one with you, and I'm sure that many of you might even know her. Tracy Lindbergh, who graduated from SunTEP, then went to school, graduated at, then went to law school, graduated at the top of her class, then went on to Harvard for her master's, then to the University of Ottawa for her PhD, and received a Governor General's gold medal at her convocation for her brilliant dissertation. Tracy today teaches at the University of Ottawa Law School 
and two years ago she published her first book, a novel, and it made it to the bestsellers list and was there for months. Now she's still teaching and she's releasing her second novel and that's just one success story, but there are many, many more that came out of the little basement door at Suntep and in Regina. There's so much for us to celebrate and so much for us to be grateful for. There've been lots of sad times, but always the dream for an education was there for our people. Not just to learn to read and write, but like my dad used to say, you have to go to school so we can be somebody. Let those people know we're somebody. My dad was a trapper and when he was trapping, fur was really poor. But I remember every time he would go into the city to sell his fur and he'd come home, come home on horseback and in his saddlebags he'd always have crayons and pencils and paper and a book. And that was really important for us because my dad couldn't read and write. If he would have been able to read and write, he probably would have been able to do so much more than he did. And he did many great things. I remember my mom sending a quarter, 25 cents, to the traveling library in Regina so that we would get a box of books once a month and the whole community would, would share in reading them. And we look forward to that box. We didn't always have a choice in what we got for reading, but that box of books was really important to us. I remember Jim Brady coming into our communities with one book. Jim was a really special kind of a guy, as many of the older people here know. He would come into the community to have one book and then he'd stay with a different person every night and he'd read a chapter. And guess what would happen? We'd all get together after he was gone because we wanted to know what happened in the story. How did it end? <laughs> what happened in the middle? And we'd have these long conversations and that was his whole thing was for us to have political conversations. So I always, when I think of GDI, I think of Jim Brady and I think of Malcolm Norris because even if they weren't here, their memories and their stuff are, are woven into our history. When we look around us today, mind you, we've always been a really fine looking bunch even when we were wearing flower sack dresses. <laughs> but look at how wonderful we look. We're, we're so privileged. We have the privilege of having university degrees. We're teaching, we're doing wonderful things in our communities. I, have, I was at a conference last week and, and listened to the young women at Westmont School talk about the Michif School that we have there where our language is, is being used, our culture and our history is being taught. That's wonderful. I mean, just imagine how many gardens are being planted. We're going to grow the best, the best, the very best of, of Métis people in our very near future. And that comes because we're good, strong seeds. I always think about Don Nielsen. Don was a young leader that was mentored by Malcolm. And I don't know how many knew, but he was the first PhD that I ever knew. He was a teacher, but he also had his PhD in psychology. Why on earth he took psychology? I don't know, maybe he was trying to figure out government, but he took it. <laughs> but he was a young leader and we were all organizing to do some protest or something. And, and he was talking, he would, when, when Malcolm wasn't there, he would be the, the radical or the militant among us. And I remember him saying that education can be a tool for assimilation or it can be the practice of freedom. And I love the sound of that practice of freedom. 
to own myself, to be self-governing, to have personal sovereignty. Education as the practice of freedom also becomes not a force that separates or fragments us, but one that brings us closer, expanding our definitions of home and community and identity. And we see that in the strength and the courage and the, the just plain audacity of our, of our artists and our writers and poets and singers. I want to thank Jordy and his staff for their commitment to this institute, for making our dream a reality. I want to thank them for their courage and letting things happen in believing and protecting. Thank you, Jordy. I want to thank Karen and her team for your intuition, your creativity, your strength and belief in Michif artists, in our culture and our language. You made a place for us and welcomed, and welcomed us. And in doing that, you made a beautiful place for our people and for our future generations. Talk about books, writers, poets, artists, singers, filmmakers, playwrights. She's a hoarder, this Karen. <laughs> you can see it in all of us. Go into the art gallery, into the museum. Somebody should put her on a special show about special hoarding. <laughs> I love you, Karen. And thank you, Murray Hamilton, for the years of commitment to SUNTEP and to our students. All those beautiful students across the province, across the country and the world for making sure that they knew our heroes, heard the old battle stories for education. Marie is always telling battle stories about, you have no idea about the protests we had. <laughs> and then he'd go on, goes on and on. But thank goodness for that. Make sure that all of you never let anybody forget those things. I want to thank Earl Cook and the past chair and board of GDI for your vision and support to this good work and to our political leaders for your support and always staying arm's length. Glenn, where are you? Are you here? Because I don't know you, but your support in walking with our sisters at Batash with our River Women Collective was phenomenal. I respect and honor that because it's not often that we got that kind of support. And I pray that you'll do the same for GDI and all of our other affiliates, that you will protect them, allow them to be strong so they can do the job of creating a strong, healthy nation because that's the job of a good leader, a good man or woman. And for all of us, and for all of us, as usual, we're shining like bright stars. So nobody can ever say again that we're the forgotten people. Thank you, GDI, for all of that. Hi, hi, Marcy.